This is Star Talk Sports Edition. And for this episode, it's going to be all about the Olympics and the science that undergirds all sports that unfold in that great two weeks of human competition. And I, I got a friend and colleague and co-author to help me out here because he thinks deeply about everything. And that's, of course, Star Talk's friend, Charles Liu. Charles, how you doing, man? Hi, Neil. Good to Great get, to see you. Good, Real good, pleasure. Good to get you back. Uh, you bring Thank a, you so a, much. A, a level of insight and, and knowledge and expertise that transcends anything any of us have ever brought to the table. And that's why you've earned, I think, without question, the title Geek Expertise, right? <laughs> I think, Gary, were you the one who first told us that? Geek? Um, no, but I, I do like the dubbing him the geek in chief. The geek in chief. Of the, the geek yes, in chief. With geek expertise. Yeah. Let's talk about throwing stuff. All right. So, uh, where, where the Olympics, they go back, uh, you know, Gary, correct me if I'm wrong, 17, no, 17. No, way back. I'm, th I'm thinking of <laughs> American <laughs> Independence. Years ago. And we are 776 <laughs> B.C. Se not 1776 when B.C., 776 no, no, no. B.C. in Greece, I yeah. presume. And this is... This is a, a a quite the tradition that we've turned into in modern times. I mean, it's yeah. extraordinary. It is, it is the obvious test. We've all, growing up, who's fastest? Who can throw something the furthest? Who can run up that mountain and come back down quickest? Who can jump over this stream the furthest? So it's it's just basically the answering of all these questions on a, on a four-yearly basis. I, I think it's a beautiful thing. And it's one of the greatest collaborations of nations outside mm -hmm. of the waging of war. So, well, we have to remember that the Olympic Games were actually interrupted for more than 1500 years. Yeah. It wasn't until 1896 when the modern Olympics began again, after it ended in the Roman Empire, because indeed the Romans didn't want the Olympics to keep going. Why, why not? I'm not really sure why. why. I'm not really sure why. Something about nationalism and, and worship of the wrong gods. We lost. <laughs> Maybe that's what it was. Wait, Chuck. <laughs> How could this happen? We're the Roman Empire. We lost. That's it. No more Olympics. <laughs> so much for a sportsmanship. Yeah. All right. So let's get into the science of throwing stuff. Let's start off with the discus. Charles, what can you tell me? about the aerodynamics of a discus. Why aren't they just sort of throwing a rock? Uh, what is really cool is that a disc is way, way more aerodynamic than a sphere. Uh, in fact, it's way more aerodynamic than an airplane. It's an wow. amazingly aerodynamic object. So if you want to see something fly in the air for a long distance, what yeah. you want to do is to throw a disc. And right. that's the most dramatic thing that you can do back in those days, right? You want to see things go a long way. Throwing a rock is fun. You know, that's what a shot put is. You're basically you know, pushing this big cannonball. But that don't, doesn't go that far, right? The discus, though, can say. We all know that, well, maybe most of us know that you can spin stabilize an object as it moves yep. through the air. So a spinning football... Um, a and spinning can also, if it's a round object, give it some. Uh, there'll be a force added on it that would curve its path. But for for a discus, is it better if I spin it faster? Like why? Do, why if it's spinning at all, isn't that good enough? Why do? What, what's the with the yeah. spinning faster? Well, it's really that the faster you start the spin, the longer it'll stay spinning. Right. Think about air resistance. It'll slow the spinning down as you go forward. Okay. So the faster you start the spin, the longer it'll stay spinning, the better it will be as an aerodynamic object, and thus the more likely it will travel a farther distance. Yeah, but but airplane wings are aerodynamic and they're not spinning. So mm -hmm. why must a discus spin at all? It doesn't have to spin. If you just sort of pushed it, it would go. <laughs> it, would right? your, it would end up at your toes. You no, no, so it. You get it. For the spin. same reason, you get the spinning for the same reason that when you throw a Frisbee, right, or a spinning disc or a flying mm. disc or whatever it is, right, if you get more spin, it'll stay up longer. That It stabilizes actual, the flight, doesn't it? Yeah. And therefore, mm -hmm. if it's more stable, it travels further. Yeah. Am I and, correct in that? Yes. And also what's interesting is that as it spins, think of a, a wheel on a car, 
as it spins, it moves forward because of the friction that it has with the ground, right? There's a contact, yeah. uh, rolling without slipping, right? Which is what we learn about in physics classes. If something is spinning, it actually, some of that spin can help you carve through the air a little bit better oh, okay. than if it were not. And it occurred to me that, that if something begins to slow down and it's no longer stabilized, it could begin to wobble. And mm -hmm. that would increase the air resistance air as it moves through the air. So whereas if it's spinning, then it would stay as a sort of flat plate cutting through the air. So that makes sense to me. And, and you, what you make perfect sense, Charles. The faster it is when it le spins when it leaves your hand, the deeper into its path it can sustain the stability of its, of its arc. How about the hammer throw? Ah, even more spinning. Oh, but right. there's no aerodynamics in that, right? So that's nope, nope, nope. That's a that's a round ball that gets tossed. Now, in the olden days, I bet the Greeks did not put it on a metal wire because they didn't know how to build wire, right? No. Or even metal balls for that matter. They probably literally threw a hammer, which is mm -hmm. like a big long thing that they would use to whack things, right? right. But they actually spin around. This would be a stick onto which attached was some heavy object at the end, and you tried to throw it and see how far you could get it. You're allowed to spin. But really, the spinning process, you have to keep your um, center of weight moving in a straight line. So it's a very complicated dance. It's a ballet, really, only instead of a, a beautiful pirouette with someone wearing a tutu, right? It's a brutal spin with a gigantic individual holding a 16-pound ball on a wire and spinning beautifully and accurately. And, and, and the release point has to be exactly, exactly sort of tangent to the movement so that right. all the spinning force can go to the linear uh, trajectory of the ball itself. Of all the field sports in the Olympics, the hammer throw is the one I would least like to be a judge for mm -hmm. in the pit. Because you have to stand in, 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 in the path of the hammer. Uh, wow. I'll tell you this, Marcel. I... Um, I, I don't want to watch it anymore because I just want to see them do it in tutus now. <laughs> okay. The All tutu right. hammer throw. The tutu yeah. hammer throw, man. <laughs> if the Olympics knew what was good for them, they'd have that this summer. <laughs> Seeing as we're reinventing, Charles, what happens if I extend the length of the wire on this 16-pound cannonball and oh. then I start to rotate? Well, that's great. You see, the longer you have the wire, the larger the moment of inertia is. Mm -hmm. Moment of inertia being mr squared, the mass times the distance times the distance again. And so to translate that rotational motion into linear motion, the more, uh, uh, the more, the higher the moment of inertia, the more angular momentum you get if you're spinning it at the same angular velocity. Uh, right. Just, just, just fancy. Just means that if you have a certain number of rotations per second, mm -hmm. the longer you have of the string, the farther the hammer will go when you let it go. Because the hammer's actually moving faster. That's all, yes. right? Right. It's it's the same reason why you are going faster on the outer horse in a merry-go-round than you are on an inner horse, even though everyone's on the same platter. That's right. Right. Okay. That's why everyone. Yeah. If you ever you're burning a kid uh, to a, a merry-go-round, take an outside as opposed to an inside loop. The outside person will be moving much faster and having a, a grander- Yeah, like it's twice as fast inside. as the ones halfway yeah. in. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now now tell me about the javelin. My big disappointment was to learn that people were getting so good at the javelin that they- People in the stands were dying? <laughs> people, <laughs> almost. Almost, <laughs> almost. <laughs> yeah. That they had to put like an aerodynamic drag on the back of the javelin. That ain't right. That, no, something's wrong Well. There. It, it's a little bit different from that simply because a javelin has to come down point first into the ground. Otherwise, you run into problems. If it skims along the surface and it hits the ground, it goes bounce, 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 right? Yeah, where, did it, where did it land? Or not? Right, right. Where, right, did, where it land? did it land? And, and there's controversies involved with that. And that, if you make sure that the javelin lands point first in the ground, you can set yourself far enough back in the stands that you don't worry about being injured. So they had to move the uh, center of mass of the spear or the javelin closer toward the tip. And what happened was at first when they did that, uh, clever speared, or excuse me, clever javelin designers started messing with the back end. 
to make it act like you know feathers, like fletching in an arrow or something, mm-hmm. to try to let it fly longer and farther and things like that. And so that got banned after a short period of time. Uh, but the key is that they ha- now. A days the javelin is more like you throw it up in the air and it's got to come down and is naturally going to jab into the ground at some location. Okay. So what is the what is the optimum angle that you have to release a javelin to get it to go the farthest? Well, indoors, right? <laughs> without any air, it's forty five degrees. Uh, yeah. Without okay. So this is the, uh, the on the on the moon the the yeah. airless arena. This is where we're yeah. going to do this. Okay. Right. The answer is always 45 degrees. However, well, Let's be honest, Charles. You're not going to be throwing javelins indoors very much. No. You know what? I've wondered. In indoor track and field championships, are there actually javelins? No. Indoors? No, there's no. not. No. no. The oh, only thing you'll man. ever have is shot put indoors. None <laughs> of the other throwing events and are allowed. Too bad. Even maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Oh, well, that, that explains it. Yes. Uh, the wind determines a lot. Uh, again, the, as we were talking about with the discus, with anything in the air, which direction, whether it's an updraft or a downdraft, whether it's a headwind or a tailwind, that makes all the difference in any projectile. I don't have the actual angles depending on that, but I know that compensations must be made. Right. And this 45 degree angle, you learn that in physics 101, where you want it to go forward and up with the same initial velocity, and that'll carry it farthest to its destination. And that angle is 45 degrees every time. That's right. They used so, to teach us when, when we were throwing javelins to pull through the javelin. You start with a certain angle of approach where it's basically horizontal to the ground. Then it tilts up. You keep it really close to your ear. And then you pull through almost the handle, the binding through the center point, And it flies and then it sails and then it comes down. But since they were throwing, they got one German thrower whose name I cannot quite remember through over a hundred meters, which will have scared the living daylights out of anybody else at the far end of the stadium. Wow. Especially the runners who are thinking, I, I almost got this, I'm on the back yeah. stretch. And then he gets impaled, <laughs> exactly. coming around. So, and there's, you know, you've, you've got all these other events happening while javelins are being thrown. So they just had to go, uh oh, nope, got to make a change. So, and, and lastly, the shot put, that's the bluntest mm. of all instruments mm. here. And uh, this th- this has like been in every single Olympic since 1896, and I n- understand it dates back to like the Middle Ages. Is that right? When soldiers hurled cannonballs to compete? Is this? Do I have this right here? Yeah, I, I think what That's we have, it. Neil, is in between battles, a bun- bunch of drunken soldiers picked up <laughs> cannonballs and said, "Which one of us drunken idiots can throw this the furthest?" <laughs> That sounds a lot like reality to me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Makes sense to me. Maybe they just ran out of gunpowder and they were, <laughs> I will hey, throw this, this at you. <laughs> <laughs> this is all we got, guys. <laughs> Carry this cannonball over and drop exactly. it on the head right. and then come back for another one. <laughs> While you're at it, everybody throw your musket pellets. <laughs> <laughs> now, you say that, but you know what? Just in the last couple of weeks from the time we're recording this, in the last week, I think, Ryan Krauser, USA, broke the world record. 76 feet with a 16-pound mm, cannonball. Ouch, man, that's that's brutally strong. That's, that's, yeah. And he, you know there's that technique where you glide across the circle? Yes, yeah. I've seen now, that. Uh-huh. And we've seen all of that, and there's the crouch. This is now using the discus rotation to achieve mm. these distances. Oh, so they're coiling energy like yeah. like the discus yeah. people do. Okay, mm-hmm. so it's tactical and, and I guess it's allowed, right? They're not gonna mm. say you can't do that. Not just big guys with a big old chalk mark under the chin. <laughs> There's a lot more going on. <laughs> but what about the power of the guttural yell? Mm-hmm. Oh. The, the, the vocalization of shot putters, I think is the most amazing that you hear yeah of any of those athletes just like this this elephant alligator godzilla kind of auditory utterance <laughs> that simply cannot be matched by any other human being well they, they have to do that because if they don't they'll crap themselves <laughs> <laughs> 
Is that, they can't hold it in. Is that what you're saying? They can't hold it in, man. You <laughs> gotta let that. You gotta let it out at one or other on the other end. That's one or the other end. That's gotta come out. Thank you, Chuck, for that physiological analysis of the shot put. Oh man. <laughs> Do you have any shot putter friends? Yeah, Maybe my dentist anymore. was a shot putter. My dentist was a shot putter. Wait, so, so, so Charles. Uh, last yes. question before we t- we got to sure. take a quick break here. The yeah. it seems to me the shot put would be the least susceptible to aerodynamics, and yeah. so that one you'd want to sort of throw at a forty five degree angle. I would say is probably at almost all times. Yeah, I don't see yeah, any that, reason why. I don't see uh, unless you're in a I. hurricane or something. You know, uh, that it's going to affect right. this Perfect. round, spherical, solid metal ball. All right, guys, great to have you here. Charles, Lou, always great to have you on Star Talk. Thank you. Thanks for being such a friend of the show. We got to call it quits there. This has been Star Talk, Sports Edition, the Olympics. I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, bidding you to keep looking up. 